Hey guys. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey. How are you? Hey. We got you. Who's on the team? Oh, um, that's because I think. Okay. Yes, it's me today. Very good. Gosh, it might be all of us. Yeah, I was busy the last couple of weeks, just out of town and things, so had to take up some time off, more or less. Yep. Congratulations on the IPO, by the way. I mean, it's a... well, yeah, it was uh, an acquisition, uh, yeah, which but... is sometimes oh, yeah, better. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you are probably. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't. A, I'm. I'm just a you know a, a bit player in in the company. Uh, I, right. I help with the monitoring of their systems, but it's all a team effort to make a product yeah, sure. that yeah. apparently. Uh, so this, the, the actual product they have, the service, started like 25 years ago, gathering data from jails and. Uh, to get incarceration data mm -hmm. initially to notify victims when somebody was released from That's jail. Okay. That was, and now it's valuable as uh, basically as information for doing background checks. Oh, I um, see, okay. okay. Yeah. So at Equifax is in that business, uh, mm -hmm. what they call their workforce solutions which helps to verify employ, no, um, uh, candidates' work histories plus probably any kind of you know, incarceration history or something like that. Okay, yeah. But the numbers are huge. I mean, you know, to go from zero to $1.8 billion in even 25 years is pretty commendable for the yes. founders. Yeah, well, I mean, the prison industrial complex is a big business in the US, right? So. It is, it is. Um, yeah. And we, you know, our company took advantage of a lot of things. Right. Victim, yeah. victim rights has mm -hmm. changed over the past few decades, which just fueled the need for notification services and data mm -hmm. services surrounding right, right, uh, incarceration um, and a large barrier to entry. It turns out every jail is run differently because ah, that's, see, see. that's how the United States works. Yeah, well, private prisons, right? I mean, so everybody would have their own, um, you know, they wouldn't share data across much like right. insurance companies. Yeah. yeah, there's no there's no compelling reason to do that. Right. Um, and every small jail in every local, in every county is independent. They, you know, they, they choose their own data sets and everything. So the founders had the great idea of basically putting a PC inside the jail, right in the, mm -hmm. see, in, okay. the in the closet. Right. And just jumping on their network so they could do SQL queries against their booking system. Um, uh, okay. So you, the barrier to entry is that we, early in the early days, had a person on the road, you know, maintaining literal PCs on modems. Oh, and, I see. Okay. Yeah. and now it's all just VMs, but it's still like we just have a little network device that... Um, allows a VM to mount basically a, 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 it actually runs the same programs that it did even 15 or 20 years ago. <laughs> so simple like batch scripts that do queries against their booking system. Wow. Yeah. So it kind of shows you that you can, you can handcraft a company to do oh, yeah, something absolutely. very yeah. unique yeah. over time. So anyway. And you know, the data is valuable at this point. So it's, that's good. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly. good. Yes. So. Especially in concert with other data. Right. Yeah. So. Equifax is changing. They, you know, they got hurt really bad by the breach. So mm -hmm. they've uh, started to. I mean, they got a new CEO, and oh, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, they re kind of reinvented their company. Uh, architect the infrastructure is much different than it used to be. Of course, cloud based and uh, right. anyway, well, very good. So yeah. what? Uh, yes. So. Coming back to this uh, course, um, we are actually done, right? Um, I believe there was one person who is no longer with the team who actually pushed really hard for, you know, this high speed thing, right? Uh, well, that's it, true. Yeah, that's true. So, but uh, so I, I think uh, last week was our 16 and 17, and that was the two final things. And uh, yeah, I did collab three. I finished that. 
Wow. Um, I didn't look at it. Well, I mean, you've been busy, right? I mean, you've been out on vacation with your grandkids. Um, but uh, there is actually Colab 5 as well. So there is still Colab 4 and 5 left to do. Um, yeah. yeah. Are they good? Are they, uh, is it fairly I straightforward? Have, I haven't even looked at Colab 4 and 5. Uh, Colab four, uh, 3 was, um, let me think. Um, Actually, let me look it up. I forgot what yeah, it was. I'm trying to see which one I had. I started, oh, I started that one. Yeah, it, it actually was uh, interesting because uh, it gave me you know, a lot of grief. But then I finally, wait, Collab 4 is, no, wait, call it Collab 4. Let me Collab. see. Three. I started it. I actually have a copy of it in my browser. So I obviously okay. started it. Okay. Right. Oh, it's more of the same. Let's see, the GNN stack. Um, yeah, okay. So I finished uh, Collab 3 I had on, done already before. Um, Collab 4 is what I finished. This is about heterogeneous graphs, uh, where they basically talk about uh, graphs with two kinds of labels. And they're, so essentially, in the graph neural network has to work independently on these two kinds of labels. So changes to the, I think it is a graph sage. Um, layer, which uh, has to deal with that now. What is the um, two different kinds? Of, what uh, What is it actually labeling? A subgraph or? Uh, it, it is a graph node, pro graph node property prediction. OK. Node properties. So, OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, heterogeneous means? Uh, multiple types. So uh, the nodes can be different types. So customers and orders oh. or, you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. And then it's predicting different properties on, on, the, on different node types even? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, um, let's see, what does GraphSage, I'm trying to like, I, I don't know if I could say in a sentence what GraphSage does as different than, uh, so oh, it, um, it does, um, yeah, well, I mean, um, GCN is just a uh, um, average of all its neighbors, including itself. Okay, right. Uh, GraphSage is kind of, it has a residual connection, right? For, it treats itself as a little different than uh, the neighbors. And- um, That's right, it's got the aggregator of the neighbors. Right, yeah. And I think that's, that's it. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm just trying to make sure I have a you know a good working knowledge of words that, that we use as we go along. Because now, like I did actually watch about the first 30 minutes of the um, um, video of the woman biology researcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Stuff. I mean, it's finally getting to where all the stuff we've learned is actually used in a in a real world situation of, of predicting diseases or in, in her case the first example is drug interactions mm -hmm. yeah which, which is it's just so fascinating because she explains exactly how the proteins interact or you know the fact that uh, two different drugs have two different molecules and these two molecules have different proteins and when they are literally near each other, they begin to interact in a certain way that's, that's known and predictable. And independently, they don't have adverse effects, but together they do on, right. on, a, yeah. on a given yeah. patient. And so she walks through how to set up the network. In this case, there was a case where there was heterogeneous. The nodes was, um, let's see. I can't remember now, but um, so good. All this stuff is kind of coming together and uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to, I think, walk through all the tutorials, right. all the videos and yeah, probably I'm, keep doing the collabs. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, complete, uh, you know, four. so I've done five. Now I have, sorry, uh, I've done collab four. So I have collab five left still to do. Um, so I'll finish that and go back to her, uh, homework three, I think, or homework four. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's still left to do. And I wanted to actually loop back through all the you know, lectures once more. 
because uh, this is you know the way I've done it right now is like the first time you read a paper, like you know, okay, that's how I do it generally. Mm-hmm. So I basically skim the paper, you know, just get to know what it is, yeah, so that I get a general feel for the thing. Right. Then I right. go back in and you know, uh, but because we were moving so fast, I actually have basically just skimmed the course, so I know what's where, <laughs> but not much more than that. <laughs> Right, right. No, I mean, you seem to have a pretty good handle on all the mechanics as well, yeah, yeah, which, yeah. which does help. Um, that's a good idea to go back and just go, because it should be fairly easy at this point to implement right. the things that we've kind of spent a lot of time on. Um, yeah, also Vikas's point about the, you remember asking about, I, I said that there was a guy who was doing polypharmacy. He was in the polypharmacy project. And you said- Yeah, yeah you had mentioned some time back, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. you said like, maybe he could come speak to us. So I asked him. Yes, I did. And, oh, wow. Well. Yeah. And he was initially agreeable, mm-hmm. uh, but he said, I have to, you know, because it's like a very hush-hush project at this point, like very you know, kind of cutting edge for us at least. So um, he would have to clear it with his uh, company. Uh, but then he got an early retirement, um, basically oh. a, a separation, right? What, what is it called? Mm. Golden handshake kind of thing, right? Yeah. So he had one year left and basically they asked him to go and they gave him a nice package, severance, severance package. Good for um, him. Yeah. Unfortunately, the severance includes a gag order on yeah. what he was doing. <laughs> so oh. now he cannot talk about it. <laughs> oh, cool. Not even in general terms. Uh, um, yeah, he's he said, you know, I, I just cannot talk about it anymore. Right. So said, oh, okay, all right. No. Not worth the, the risk. Yeah, exactly. Um, so polypharmacy, or uh, what is? So tell me more, like just in general, what does that mean? So uh, most people with uh, okay, it's not most people. So if you look at insurance numbers, uh, the people who are the highest, uh, you know, the people who cost the insurance company the highest are people with uh, multiple um, diseases, right? So, which kind of makes sense, right? So right. if you're just, you know, so if you have chronic multiple diseases, you know, all working against each other, um, you'll cost them more. So they are like high value clients for them. And uh, one other thing is that when you have multiple diseases, you are prescribed multiple drugs, some of which may work against each other, right? Um, or have uh, side effects. So initially we talk about uh, side effects mostly, right? Um, whether the adverse effects, so that's what it's called. So, right. you know, you might be taking medication for a certain disease and then you have, you know, another disease comes up and uh, the doctor prescribes something without knowing what you're already being prescribed awesome. or even with knowing, right? right? And he just doesn't have the time to analyze what you're having and, you know, what he's prescribing, right? And right. that can lead to um, issues, right? So you, you might impact the, pres- uh, the patient's health and so forth. Absolutely. Um, so the whole polypharmacy thing is basically to figure these things out automatically, right? So the you know when the you basically look at a patient record and say, okay, this guy is, has these diseases and these are the medications he's having. You know, are any of these uh, going to interact with each other? Somehow? Right. Should oh my that. gosh! Did you you should watch uh, lecture eighteen. It's hmm. ex- okay. it's exactly what that is. This lady right. exactly right yeah yeah. This is exact. I just read I, that's. I saw polypharmacy earlier today mm-hmm. in her lecture. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think I remember that. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, so, do they have? Uh, she did mention that sometimes it's it's quite. So it's not really big data. It's actually small data because yes. there are not many reports of adverse reactions. As, as many as you think, especially well, among two particular types of drugs. Well, adverse reactions is just a subset of polypharmacy. Yeah. So, um, you know, so uh, again, it's, it's small data if you think about, you know, what is the percentage of the data? Right. But uh, there is a lot of uh, very sick people, you know, in absolute terms. So in that sense, it is big-ish data because, you know, sure. all these insurance companies' uh, records, right, they would... Um, uh, be quite large, but uh, you're totally right. I mean, in in uh, relative terms, it's actually quite small, you know, compared to the amount of insurance data that you have. Okay, so pharmacy doesn't mean pharmacy dispensers; it's pharmaceuticals generally. Yes. Okay, I was thinking, like, uh, what interest would there be in in 
in the uh, pharmacy, but you're talking about just the, the drug to drug interaction. Correct. We are, we are looking at it from the point of view of a doctor, right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, that's what uh, we, you know, our health uh, thing is right. basically targeted at uh, the medical profession, right? So, uh, you know, the analytics piece and all these things. So we are, we are mostly looking at it from the point of view of the doctor, but we are using insurance company sure. data to, sure. uh, you know, kind of identify these cases. Yeah, she said that uh, adverse reactions are estimated to cost se several billion dollars per year, mm -hmm. be just because of various reasons. I guess they have to be treated, plus I guess there has to be adjustments made if there are adverse reactions. So knowing them ahead of time. Right. Is also, uh, patients can sue because, you know, we yeah. live in a very litigious friendly yep. En yep. environment, right? Yep. Um, so only certain contraindications are known. Exactly. Right. And yeah. so this would be using just general, you know, protein to protein interactions to try to predict um, what combinations. So the doctor would be uh, just kind of put on notice that, that, that a particular patient's current... Yeah. So when, when he prescribes something or, you know, we can scan and, uh, you know, existing patients, uh, you know, whatever they are being prescribed, take his um, medical records and flag interactions, right? Flag things that the doctor should look at. And, um, mm -hmm. or as they add uh, things, we can flag it and say that, you know, this is probably not what you should be doing. I Ultimately, see. we don't want to replace the doctor. We are basically, you know, we are a digital assistant, basically. Assistant, right, right. right. Yeah, she actually went into the next thing, which was phenotype mm -hmm. of the patient, knowing yeah. exactly things about the patient and how those histories would be the training set to try to understand, right. you know, a certain patient who has a particular, you know, um, genetic. Yeah. Uh, well, visible symptoms, that's what phenotypes are, right? Anything, you know, things, oh, things yeah. you can measure yeah. and look at, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, I guess you know, weight or um, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, other things. Uh, phenotypes are basically uh, the expressions of the genes. So there are genotypes and phenotypes. Exactly. So, right. so if, uh, genotypes mm -hmm. refers to what exactly you have. So if they suppose you a person, I mean, uh, in going in a bit detail. Uh, so uh, if I have, if I have two genes there one is recessive one is uh, dominant so my phenotype will be dominant but my genotype will have both exactly right, right. Okay. Yeah. something you can a characteristic yeah a phenotype okay visible characteristics i, I think uh, uh, sujit was mentioning i guess right. interesting so those yeah that, that that's important to to doctors um to know um and, and doctors do know, I mean, their medical education is, you know, trains them to uh, know these things, but, um, you know, they are in, uh, right now they are kind of rushed most of the time, right? They don't have time to, um, for patients. So, you know, this is to help them basically. You know. Right. So if say they want to prescribe a certain type of, of blood pressure they, medicine, they might have five or eight options mm -hmm. and they might be told these are the three that, that, Given the the history of the patient and what they are currently taking, we we suggest these three, not all eight. And they usually yeah, exactly. have a good gut for which one mm -hmm. works yeah. best. Yeah. Um, so that's great. That's uh, that, that's very interesting. Um, yeah. So I think lecture eighteen is. I, I I kind of fast forwarded through the lectures to kind of get to the first one of the guest speakers. And so um, I, I kind of wanted to get an example of real life examples of, of these things. And um, this was a good one. It's still kind of like, I don't quite know how it becomes a, a tool, but um, at least it's more of an example than we've had before. Yeah. I guess we could take any of the data sets, the, the protein data sets or the enzymes and, and just come up with our own toy problems. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which, you know, sometimes is useful. I like to kind of, you know, when you're in the middle of all the code, it's one thing, but then if you're at the, you want to kind of push out a little bit and say, okay, um, what, you know, I have an unknown thing here and I want to predict something about it. Um, 
And I want to like write the code that has, you know, input the, the, the file here and then output the class here. I sometimes want it just to be that simple with uh, the code, the code behind it somewhere, but we haven't really gotten there yet. Yeah, in my in my current role, so I got moved out of uh, well, not moved out, temporarily moved into a health uh, to helping a health team in mm -hmm. uh, more of an engineering kind of role. Uh, so in my previous role, I had to beg for access because we are very siloed, right? You know, mm -hmm. we kind of group the acquisitions, so everybody has its own little empire. So um, you know, anytime you want some data, you have to like jump through tons of hoops right? yeah. and basically beg for access. But now that I am in this, right, uh, I don't have access to everything, but I have access to everything that this group controls, no questions asked. Wow. Right. So that, that is uh, like a huge thing, right? So, you know, I, I have a bunch of ideas which I'm just trying out. So it's uh, the, the downside is that you don't have much time to try out ideas because you are very managed. Your, you know, your right. day is like, uh, you know, you have to have issues or tickets. Yep. To justify yep. your existence, kind of thing. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not like a, a research role. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you actually have to justify what you're doing as, mm -hmm. which is, I've, I've learned a game that where you, you kind of pad the ones that you know are kind of easy, the issues mm -hmm. that are kind of easy. You mm -hmm. pad it. Like we use Jira and mm -hmm. we use, you know, Sprint, Agile and everything. So we have to estimate the number of points. Right. And uh, okay. I, uh, something I know will take, you know, half a day i go ahead and give it a three story points mm. which is generally three days okay okay yeah, right. and then, so then the, it gives you time yeah. yes to go you know work on things that i know don't matter um right, right. or, or they, they matter but only in an experimental sense exactly yeah. Yeah. okay that, that's good good this is a good idea I'm going to try most it. people are pretty happy with they don't mind if you pad it as long mm. as you just kind of keep hitting it you, you know right, right, you got to right. deliver something for for that so you get you can kind of get a little flair with your delivery to make mm -hmm. it look like it was much more than you know it only took a few hours <laughs> right. but and that's a good that's a good skill too right, right. i do i do tend to write uh, much more in detail in the jira tickets because i noticed that most people don't write anything right they write the issue they said okay fixed right yeah. and, and then i kind of like to write it you know what i did because that way you know in the remote chance that somebody else has the same problem they can look it up and you know, do the same exactly thing. oh yeah it's just kind of a i don't know about pride i end up writing a a, a wiki entry somewhere and linking oh, okay. to it hmm. and so then i have a list of wiki entries about nice. all my okay. tickets right right yeah. um for my reference yeah you yeah i that? do that too i uh, you know at least where you know where everything is you know file uh, locations and stuff i've started doing that yeah. yep yep Excellent. Okay, that's that's interesting. So you're in an area of that's health uh, information, or is there what kind of data sets? Um, mostly documents like literature, okay. medical, you know, textbooks and uh, journal oh, articles and so forth. Rich. And it is very rich, yes. Um, but um, you know, the main problem that we have is lack of label data. Um, mm. It's very hard to get, and uh, you know, and because uh, we don't have too much label data, there is a lot of noise in the label data. So we cannot really do much with, you know, with what we have. Yeah. So I'm trying to focus on more unsupervised kind of techniques, you know, where you kind of leverage um, a small amount of training data to create something and then you, you know. Improve uh, it, have it kind of self-improve yeah. as it yeah. goes. And basically have the, you know, the half-baked model make predictions and have humans correct it and then you know yep. just keep repeating it over and over again so yeah 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 you do i do hear about that i, I listen to the twimmel prod podcast and right, right. that seems to come up a lot this mm -hmm. uh super yeah. active human, learning yes. human in the loop exactly yeah right um, to help just label get well, at least and that's what what is that that is actually um confirming it's kind of it's kind of doing like a supervised label of yes of the unsupervised parameters in a sense You're yes picking. to some extent yes yeah uh so the, there's some companies that are actually trying to get good at labeling um like somehow packaging that as a service 
to where I guess they can, you can give them a bunch of unlabeled data and maybe they package it in a sense where they can get back to one of your humans in, in a way that's you know, very low impact to, to confirm, you know, like imagine that service we just talked about, like, um, you know, being an actual service or um, synthetic data. That's not, you could not do that with words. I don't think with right. um, yeah. documents. We, we do have like a very tight pipeline called Prodigy. And uh, basically it's from the Spacey guys. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's Prodigy, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a paid software, uh, but it's like, uh, well, they use Spacey a lot, the Spacey features, but it's a very, very tight uh, integration. So, you know, it, it works out very well, um, at, at least so far that we have used. Does a good job of topic modeling generally, or um, not really topic modeling? It's mostly like the active learning pipeline. So you you know you give it some data and some labels. It will create a model automatically for you, and then it will then you you know send oh. the rest of your data against that, and it will create the you know the output, and then it does some internal stuff where it says, okay, you know, I'm going to try and get the maximum variation, right? All the areas where the errors are but yes. it's not like you know if i cannot learn anything from you know multiple levels then i won't you know waste the uh, human's time right so i will pick up things that are separate enough right and then give a subset to the human he labels it so then you know it can use this uh, you know the new labels more effectively right yes yes that's this so fascinating where if you take the the things that it missed by a lot that's right. actually meaningful. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And those are the ones you might need help with from, from a human. The other ones, you pretty much got it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's very interesting. I don't, I guess that's generally just like a stream of words and then some labels to help categorize um, a, a given stream of, of words. Right. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. There was some. I heard a guy on Twimmel and I went and actually looked at their tool. Fascinating, um, like a bitmap. They took a bunch of words and somehow turned it into a bitmap. And the proximity of the words to each other, it was, not, it was kind of like word to vec, but a much, much reduced dimension space, like two dimensions. It, it got it down to two dimensions. And the words were in the space of those two dimensions in a meaningful way. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there's quite a few uh, yeah. like that. I think pretty interesting. Latent spaces are very fascinating mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried to do um, latent space work, and it's never where you. I guess the G, uh, GG. What is the um, Gaussian? where it basically guesses and then it tries to tune it um, to what the, it tries to guess features through some neighboring mechanism. And then it, it, it fits a Gaussian okay. data. Gaussian it, process maybe? It's yeah. GP? Yeah. Uh, head two G. Okay. Yeah. I forget, but um, yeah. pretty interesting where you're trying to represent features that you don't know about. Right. Yeah. And use that to help, uh, you know, build a model. Um, with which the data actually, that you have. which actually reminds me. So, if you're interested in latent spaces, um, there is this unsupervised uh, learning class going on. It uh, meets every Sunday, uh, eight to ten. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I started that. Okay. Um, and it was very looked very. Mm -hmm. It's very theoretical. Oh, yes. that was the, yeah, it was very interesting, but mm -hmm. I realized it was going to get uh, heavy fast. Yes, it is quite heavy. Um, um, you know, and I have to catch up because, uh, you know, I've been kind of coasting on that one yeah. uh, for a while because I didn't have time with uh, the DLPy torch and this one. So, but now I have to kind of go back and mm -hmm. kind of focus on that one a little bit. What was the core concept early in that? Um, it started with autoregressive models. Oh, yes, yes. Then, the auto, the auto encoding. Yes, that, that's one of the well, auto encoding, but in a certain direction, right? 
So it's like uh, you only look uh, backward. Oh, that's right. Forward. Right. The um, the image the image going from from yes. top right to lower left. Yes, exactly. That right. was right. and statistically that yeah. was fascinating. I've never seen never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where you're predicting the the bits uh, with us, and that that's so sensible because because it's just true that that there's got to be some um, probability space that's that's in, in a in a in anything like that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trying to use that that's uh well yeah that was kind of over my head i wanted to kind of get my feet wet with anything with graphs because i've never really messed with graphs and now that we have a working knowledge of network x even just getting getting handy with that and, um I, th I think i could yeah what was the name of the channel? Are you saying it tomorrow, Sunday on? Uh, let me let me check. I, it's unsub something deep. Okay, deep underscore unsub underscore twenty one. I'll I'll write it here. Yep, I have okay, it actually in, in my. Uh... Oh, variation and auto encoders introduction to the mm -hmm. that is week eight. Have, uh... Yeah, it's uh, even though it well, it's week eight is uh, true, but uh, we have been going super slow, so it's actually the oh. third lecture. So each lecture is around two hours, though. I mean, just to be clear, uh, we are midway in the third lecture. Okay. So, yeah, they like I think people have posted the DL uh, lectures too, like variational auto encoder. I can see. <laughs> yes yes yeah i think there was talk about it last time oh. um Maybe I'll just... yeah. yeah i thought that was very interesting but i really need to you know catch up basically mm. um, you know i have to go back in and really understand the auto regression part i kind of understand based on just listening to people talking about it um i i went through the uh, lectures as well but no actually i didn't go through the lectures. sorry i went through the notes uh, because I didn't have time for the lectures. So I went through the notes and uh, or the slides and, mm -hmm. you know, I got something out of it. And then, you know, listening to the, uh, the, the person who led the group, um, listening to that was also quite helpful, but I yeah. think I need yeah. some more, uh, you know, like effort on my part right. you know, to basically go in. Yeah. That one I could tell was going to ramp up really quick and I wanted to, to do this one. And I think I can only do one at a time. That's just, and even yeah. that, you have to be careful in yeah. your real life. But yeah, it's hard. Huh. Well, let's see. So, Colab 3 looks pretty doable. It's just more of the same. Uh, working through. That optimizer training. Um, deep snap. Uh, yeah, there's not much of deep snap if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, it just mentions it. Yeah. It pulls it in. What does it do with it? Visualizing. Yeah, just for visualize. And he gives you the code. So uh, you can just read right. the code. You don't have to. No, build it. Okay, well, so far there's nothing. Yeah, and there's a little bit where he asks you, you know, find the number of classes and the number of features and so on. So, yeah, that's okay. not really that hard to do. Basic and then uh, splitting. Oh, good. So, is it uh, neighborhoods? What's the splitting part? Uh, um, it uses uh, some heuristics for splitting. Um, there was a, a lecture about it, you know, uh, how these decisions are made to split. You know, uh, some of them uh, try to cut um, across the most, you know, do min cuts basically, right? So, and, uh, and chop the graph up. Some people just do it randomly and, you know, just drop the edges where they cross the boundaries. And there's one other uh, thing. So and so these uh, splitting algorithms in deep snap, they basically have them built in, right? So you don't have to think about it. You just have to know which one to use. Okay, and you tell it the ratio, okay. how you want to break it up. Okay, that makes sense. 
Uh, okay. Well, I will probably keep going forward in trying to, I guess, work through the, the collabs and probably keep read, listening to the lecture. I like the, the, I like the, the guest lectures because they, they have a, just a whole new aspect of, of applying this stuff and mm. in a way that, that makes the material that we learned just so relevant. Um, yeah. Even this woman goes to the point of putting formulas on. It's the same old formula, the same, you know, um, and she knows her, she knows her stuff so well, it seems. Right. Um, the, the lecture after that, though, I mean, it's mostly his graduate students, uh, less oh. uh, graduate students describing their own um, research. Oh, good. So, you know, you'll kind of go really deep and, but pretty academic, right? So, yeah. Okay. Well, that's very useful. I can't believe this stuff is like, what is Stanford? I guess they, you know, they, they, they probably don't have a problem. They probably don't have, they don't need any more students. They probably have as many students as they want. We should. <laughs> and by doing this, they are just bolstering their reputation um, worldwide by making this available. And I, I just like, I'm always trying to wonder what, what's their objective of um, making this information so, so public and even to the degree where you could almost mimic the class. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, although yeah, like yeah. I've, yeah. I think it's like, you know, they, they try to attract, uh, you know, good students, right? So by giving out this kind of information, you get to get your name up there and, you know. Oh, like the, 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 the professors and all yes. that, or yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Like even, just because I've done this, I now know a lot more about a very important aspect of it. And I know a couple of names, you know, Kip, and of course the lecturer is a, is a pioneer practically in, right. in his realm. Um, and they do it anyway. I guess they, they have these for their students. These are the actual lectures given to the students who are yes, yes. Yeah. taking it remotely. There's no real classroom. Um, some, some classes, I think there's, I think Celtic, they don't have room for all their students. So they encourage them to watch from the dorm room. And then so. lib <laughs> liberal office hours, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And they probably have their own private discussion areas where um, they're able to work through these. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Whew, it's hard. I mean, golly. I can't imagine doing two or three of these classes at once. But I guess if you spent all day in it, it might be different than just an hour every three, three days. Yeah, it was David Collins? Yeah. Uh, the, a few weeks ago, he showed us the stuff he was working on with NFTs and the graphics. <laughs> wow, really fascinating stuff. Uh, and he was trying to get to the, I guess he was interested in the graph aspect because it, it, it offered a, a very compressed representation of, of something, you know, um, that's just one aspect of using, I think, graphs to have a, you know, a compressed representation of anything. Uh, let's see, are graphs used much in imaging at all, generally? I'm not sure, I don't think so though. Yeah, yeah. Is that just because of the nature of, well, let's see. Yeah, I guess the nature of the, of the matrix, the X and the Y in the 2D space just doesn't lend itself to graph it's already, you know, positional, spatial, and it's, um, and the relationship between pixels is Long independent. Period, yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's, it's wholly independent of each other. In a, there's not. There's not. A, there's not a. I mean, there. There's no. There's no connections. There's except maybe neighbors. Neighbors might have some, right. some relationship. 
Although in an inverted way, um, you know, graphs could help. So for approximate nearest neighbors, right? So when when you're, you're doing like uh, vector-based uh, similarity, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you know, brute force vector-based similarity is very expensive because you have to do cosine similarity, you know, with for one image with all the images that you want to compare it with, right? So it's like a sequential right. search almost. So there are various approaches to um, approximate nearest neighbor. One of them is uh, basically it leverages the small worlds, the hierarchical small worlds network, right? So oh. essentially it's the a small world graph is uh, things where neighbors are you know, connected, but there are shortcuts between pixels right? or between um, uh, points, right? Across who are not necessarily neighbors. And so you can create uh, random small world graphs uh, with uh, you know, certain characteristics. And so that's exactly what they do. They, they basically take these, during indexing time, you take all these images and their vectors and you create these, uh, you know, you basically compute the neighboring uh, uh, images. And then you also compute shortcuts, right? Based on some kind of probability. And that is used for doing, you know, at query time, you use this mm -hmm. graph mm -hmm. to basically not only look for your immediate nearest neighbors, but also look for, you know, distant neighbors, huh. which might be close as well. So what's, um, what's the vector? Is that, uh, um, I mean, have you already, have you already done the um, neural net? Are you, are you basically getting the features yes. out? Okay, so you're yeah. getting features after doing um, a couple of, a neural net. Uh, right. You you basically take a trained uh, you know image net kind of thing. Okay. And then you fine tune it for your own uh, task. Okay. Thing, so, and then you use the vectors for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I do know the. So that's just for similarity, yes. image similarity. Yeah. That's yes. and that's very powerful. Very powerful. Um, I'm surprised how well it works. You can just look at your Google. I mean, there's the Google Lens L E N S. Mm -hmm. product is amazing you can just like put your camera to anything and it will f immediately find hundreds uh, of, okay. of identical pictures matter of fact i was just on vacation uh, it's, been, it's been a few years and i just took a picture of the sunset mm -hmm. and put it into google lens and it showed me uh, like a hundred pictures that were taken in the last few days from that very same beach well, wow. okay. It, wow. it could somehow identify the 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 pattern on the beach or something, mm -hmm. yeah. um, like oh, yeah. okay. like landmarks. I'm sure it, it does landmarks right. very very well. But so the I understand the features, of course, in, after running it through ImageNet are, um, you know, like they are. It's the neural net features, which are right. hard to describe, but we all know what they are. Um, how is that cos? How is cosine similarity? So it's, the idea is similar to what to work, right? So yeah. where you have this embedding space where you know words which appear in similar contexts are closer. So right. in the same way, you can you know think of this uh, the vectors that are you know oh, okay on. activated yes. uh, uh, layers that are activated are represented uh, yes. in a yeah, so yeah. because your image net is like 1000 classes, right? So it's a big enough uh, domain, right? So, uh, so that what happens is that uh, the, the embeddings kind of encode some of the semantics of the image, right? The, the embeddings that come out, the vectors that come out ah, the other right, end, right? right? Okay. They encode some of the semantics. And you know, depending on how much of the semantics are encoded ah, and how well, yeah. you can do a lot more, um, you know. Yeah. Okay. So it's the embeddings that come out of the model. Right, exactly. Um, I've never looked at those. I've, I've, I mean, I've done plenty of fast AI, and, but I've never really stopped and actually output the, the vectors. Um, okay. I should do that. And then I would like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I did quite a bit of, uh, you know, I find them quite uh, useful for images, but not so much for text. But images are quite good, actually. So well, you know what's amazing is that Google, every image you take and upload, they're 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 doing that and storing the vectors, mm -hmm. yeah. not just the image, but the vector representation. 
just to do the similarity later. Right. That's very interesting. And they probably are doing that on every aspect of our life. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, but, but storing it as vectors so that they can go back later and use it without having to calculate it each time. Yeah, there, there is a move to storing it, you know, from back to, from dense back to a uh, kind of binary. So I was reading a paper, it's called, you know, you can f find it if you look at the BPR paper or maybe I can share the thing. So uh, this is for um, uh, deep passage retrieval. So question answering um, using uh, vector search. So, and so what they did was uh, they basically uh, created a hash layer and uh, basically they said that, you know, uh, train the hash layer to, uh, uh, you know, convert the dense vector into a sparse vector, like only binary vector, zeros and ones, right? And then use Hamming distance on top of that. And they found that, uh, you know, co storage cost-wise, it's almost like 20% uh, or some absurd figure, right? It's like much smaller, 2% yeah. or 20%, I'm not sure which. The hash, and yeah. Yes, storing the hash itself, right? And the binary hash of the uh, image. Right. Uh, or the or the text or whatever uh, object you are actually the passage the, the text passage. oh okay yeah. and and you know the quality of uh, results is comparable so wow. it's in some cases it's actually better in some cases it's worse but like right. very right. close right i mean the the benchmarks they ran yeah. i think it's within two percent up or down wow but being so much more efficient to store exactly. right yeah. So, I mean, you, the Hamming distance between actual text and the it's, uh, hash representations, you're saying? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, they, so it's the Hamming distance between the query and query, uh, the binary, so the binarized uh, vector for the query and the binarized vector for the passage, right? So let me, let me uh, put this in, maybe let me have four. Yeah, this is the BPR paper. It has uh, pointers to the DPR paper. Yeah, I forget why I was looking at this before, but it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. I have to re-familiarize myself with hashes it's i thought it was just a generic function that goes one way but i didn't um, think there was any semantic meaning in it well i mean well in in general there is i mean if you think of min hash right min hash looks for a very close um, uh, you know so for plagiarism for instance right you want to find documents that look yeah not identical but really close to the original document um, so you use min hashing and min hashing basically takes, uh, oh. so the idea of hashing is that given identical input, it will produce a hash, which is identical, right? So if right. you put, you know, hash A1 and A2, where A1 and A2 are exactly the same, the hashes produced same. from each will be exactly the same as well. And if they're only slightly different, it'll produce a different thing. So essentially, you're basically using it like a projection, right? So you're taking the... Mm -hmm. So you, if you split up the text, so in, in case of plagiarism, you do that, right? You split up the text into small chunks and then you run it through the hashes. Oh. And then you basically compare the number of hashes that collided. Oh, oh okay. that's, fast. that's yeah. fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah, got it. So in that case, it's a string of hashes and the a frequency of, of collisions yes. in, indicate a high degree of, of a plagiarism. How big, yeah, is that, well, how, how big is the phrase? Three, one or two, three, four words? Um, it could be. Uh, so I think they take uh, five words. You know, so we do grams, so word grams, right? Yeah. So uh, three to five, actually seven words are also common. So we build okay. like uh, n grams of different sizes, from three to seven. Some meaningful phrase size. Yeah. Yes. yes. Not just a word or two, but a, a whole sentence practically by that point, by the time you get seven. Right. And min hashing is actually an additional step where, uh, you know, theoretically you are doing, or, or um, how do you say it? Um, you know, you're actually not counting the frequency of hashes, but you are doing an additional step where you are virtually doing the same thing, right? But in a much more performant way. 
it's another right. layer of approximation. That's okay. Okay. Huh. That's uh, interesting. Okay. And then this is a whole other level of. Uh... Okay. Yes. Well, that's good. Okay. That's a whole other adventure. One day. Okay. Well, let's see. Maybe just take it up again next week. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe we dive right. in, maybe back into some code. Might yeah, be a hopefully. good. Yeah, I will try to see if I can, um, you know, finish up the other homework or uh, the Collab 5, H3 and C5. Those are the two left for me. So right. I will try, yeah, see if I can get that done. Okay. Well, may, it's not a bad idea to, to even work through some of these problems together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to ask, you know, somebody always, it's somebody either hasn't done it yet and it would help them, or there's real questions with particular steps. All right, exactly. Um, I find that. So I'll, I'll make Colab 3 my focus this week. Um, do you think the lectures, like I'd rather not look at the lectures unless you think it's probably better to look at them? Um, for Collab 3, you should look at the relevant lecture. Okay. Uh, you know, yeah. So there, there is some additional information which might help uh, in the sense that, you know, what are the aggregation strategies each of them use? Because you'll be asked to, um, you know, implement, I think in Collab 3, uh, they ask you to implement those graph layers, right? So it's helpful if you know uh, the theory a little bit. Yeah. Or you can read up the documentation on the pi geometric uh, thing. They have these layers as well. Right, um, you know, canned. So they're you know pre-available layers. You don't have to actually implement them, but in their documentation, they have a slight amount of you know some amount of information. Also, there is some information in the collab itself. So that right works. in the paragraphs. Yeah, actually, the material, the the, the reference material for these is really great. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Generally, so okay. Well, that's uh, I think that's my my task, and maybe next week we'll have you know. Wendy back and maybe yes, somebody yeah. else to kind of keep trudging through here. Even though we're done with the lectures, we can certainly continue working through maybe just the homeworks and right, right, uh, yeah. special topics that relate to the some of the guest uh, topics. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, and, I think it would yeah. be good to have. Uh, I mean, this guest lecture. We can have discussions on guest lectures, and that is something uh, where we see the real life approaches. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I haven't gone through them yet. I'd be, but then, as you mentioned, I was I got really excited. Yeah, that seems to be interesting. About yeah, this it's just nice to watch a, another person, other than him. Perfect. He's very no, he's very impressive the way he talks and describes, but he's laying out the the theory and theory, going through yeah. the solutions. This is a person who's in the in the industry, or at least in a research sense, going through a real application of the same things we learned, but applying it to, in this case, drugs or diseases. Um, True. And it's really great. Yeah, I think you'll like it. It's just, there's only so much time. And this, this one lecture, 18 is like an hour and 18 minutes long. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I only have so many slots in my week um yeah for stuff but uh okay sounds good oh, all right okay nice Talk talking later, to then. you sure yep. absolutely yeah right. see ya all right bye bye bye, bye. bye. bye.